just prior to his most trying days on earth, which would include the Garden of Gethsemane, the mock trial, and of course his painful execution, Jesus prayed earnestly to his Father for some specific thing, some particular concern that was pressing on his heart in the last moments, last hours of his life, and that was unity. You find his last prayer to his Father in John chapter 17, and what we're going to do for the next few minutes is explore that passage and understand what Christ wanted for his people and to see through the Lord's Holy Spirit how we can find it in this day and age. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for all the many gifts that you give us. And Lord, we understand that in the last moments of your life here on earth that your prayer was for the unity of the believers. Lord, help us to understand what that means and help us to participate in that unity as you would have us do. So we ask that you would bless our study and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. In John chapter 17, we find Jesus' prayer to his Father, this direct communication from the Son, who is now at this point completed 30, uh, over 30 years of, uh, of life and three and a half years of ministry, coming to the close of his time here on earth. And his last thoughts are found in John chapter 17 as Jesus prayed these words. And I want you to see that the, the trajectory of his thought, the, the concept he was wrestling with, comes through in the outline of this chapter 17. It's only 26 verses long, but there are three different sections here that I want to highlight. First, verses 1 through 5. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had before with you before the world was. Notice that Jesus, in the opening of this prayer, speaks to his Father directly. A very intimate Father and Son talk. No mention of anything else except, I have come here. I have accomplished what you asked me to do. I have finished your work. And Lord, if it's acceptable, I want to come now. Be faithful even unto death, basically saying, he says in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. So he wants to be reunited to his Father with the glory which I had before, with you before the world was. So you see, he doesn't say it explicitly, but he's talking about a unity between himself and his Father. Glorify me together, bringing back to where we were, the glory that we had together before the world was. Then he shifts his attention, starting with verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. So notice he takes it from, I have finished your work. Now he's talking, talking about the men you have given me, speaking of his disciples. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have, know, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. And then he says in verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those who you've given me, that they may be one as we are. So notice he first was talking about his oneness with the Father, and now he extends it and he says, Lord, now I pray for them that they may be one even as we are. And he continues, while I was with them, I kept them, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you have given me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Of course, a reference to Judas, his betrayer. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that, they should, that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So again, the first five verses, he's speaking of his relationship with his father and the work he's accomplished in his name. And now he says, now I'm praying for them that they may be held fast, held together, united in as one as we are one. And then he finishes with verse 20 and onward. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he starts with unity of the father and son then the son and his disciples, and he said, even those who I have not personally met yet, but those who will believe in me through their word. Verse 21, what is his prayer? That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Notice the burden on his heart is not just for his own coming back to Christ, to to God the Father, but now he's praying for his disciples and even those whom the disciples will someday reach, that they all may be one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. The burden on Christ's heart just before going before this awful trial and discouraging time and death on the cross was not only for his relationship with the Father that it was secure, but also that there might be a unity among A, his disciples, and B, all those whom the disciples would reach, so that the unity they would have would be a reflection of the unity that the Father and Son would have. So that when they see them, they would get a glimpse of us. Father, I not only pray for them, but all those who believe, make them one even as we are one. Unity was the burden of his heart. So, what is the basis of this unity? Should people just hold hands, sing kumbaya, and get along? Just everybody be happy and call it unity. Is this what Christ was talking about? What's the basis of this unity? You know, there's an interesting text. In Amos chapter 3, it says, Can two walk together unless they be agreed? For instance, you can't walk with someone if you're headed in two different directions. Now, you can pray for unity all you want. You can pray for a good relationship. But if one person's going one way and one person's going the other, you're not going to be united. There must be a common basis, a common purpose, a common goal. And so the question is, Christ says, let them all be one. But upon what basis? What should be the uniting element? Should it just be the name of Jesus? Or how about just the name of God? Or just we're all people, therefore, is this what Christ was talking about? Let's look back and see what he actually says. Notice the basis of true unity is the word of God. Go back to verse 6 when he talks about his disciples. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. We go to verse 8. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. Notice the common thing is always they believe the word. They believe the word. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And the reason they're not of the world is because they are of the word. The common element is not just humanity. It's not just theocracy. It's not just because they believe in God or even the name of Jesus. There's some sort of combined unity here based on the word of God. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Notice that there's an equivalent set up between the word of God and truth. They're to be united in the truth, and that truth is found only in the word of God. 
verse 19, and for their sake I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth, which have already been said is the word of God. Then he brings it out to all Christians, all who would believe in Christ through the word of the disciples. It says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So what were they were supposed to go out and preach was not just the name of Jesus, not just their own personal testimony, but as the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, he says, preach the word. That was supposed to be the basis of the unity. I do not pray for these alone, but also those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Notice that the unity of the word would bring together all of God's people as he wanted it. He wants it to be based on fidelity to the word of God. The truth of the word of God is what Jesus had delivered to the disciples and what the disciples were supposed to share to bring other people to faith in Christ. The unity that Christ desired for his disciples and for all Christians was to be established upon the word of God. Let's find this equivalence in other parts of Scripture. As we go to the book of Acts, the early church records that this was the basis of the unity. Now we think of all in one accord, and we think of the early church. They were so wonderful. They were so loving. They were so united in their faith. But what was the basis of that unity? Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And then the very next thing says, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Why were they so united? Why could they have everything in common and shared? Because they were built on a unity of the word. The word brought them together in unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. The unity that Christ wants is a, is a decisive unity, an intellectual, built on the word of God type of unity, not some fuzzy, emotional, just lowest common denominator. He said, no, no, uplift the word of God. And as you walk closer and closer to the word of God, you will walk closer and closer to each other. Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. To what purpose? Verse 13 till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Notice we want to be Christ-like. We want to have the fullness of Christ like he experienced, but how do we get it? From being united in faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So a truly united church does not have, oh, this segment's going this way with this doctrine. This one has this one, this one. No, 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 no. They're going to be united, not just in name, but in the word of God. Again, verse 14, that they should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth, again, the truth, the equivalence that Jesus said, your word is truth speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice it says, once you're founded and grounded and rooted in this word of God, then you can begin to have unity and symmetry and you start to grow together and develop and build into the body of Christ. But that unity foundation is the word of God. Again, Philippians chapter one now, verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ 
so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Notice that the common bond of unity over and over and over again from Jesus' prayer all throughout the rest of the New Testament is the bond of faith that's founded in the Word of God. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice, even if you're claiming the name of Christ, but you're walking contrary to the instruction in God's Word, he says that inherently separates. But if we walk in the light, of course, the Scripture is a light unto our path, unto our feet. He says, if you walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. It's not something contrived. It's not something just a program. It's not something, a facade that we put on. It's a deep-seated unity based on an understanding of the Word of God, the truth that He wants us to know. Now, one of the interesting themes that you see throughout Scripture is that every truth that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Every truth that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Right there in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God says, you shall surely die. Satan says, you shall not surely die. You'll live forever. God says, no, you won't. Satan says, yes, you will. There's a counterfeit. A different type of, there's, a counter, there's, the true, there's the true day of worship. There's a false day of worship. You look in the book of Revelation, there's a true trinity. There's a false trinity. There's a true church. There's a false church. There's a true city. There's the false city. There's the seal of God. There's the mark of the beast. Everything that God does true, Satan tries to counterfeit. And if Christ wants his believers to be united together on a foundation of the Word of God, don't you believe, brothers and sisters, that Satan would have a counterfeit to God's truth? Now, you would think automatically, of course. So if Christ wants us to be united, Satan wants us to be divided. But let me tell you this. Division is not a good counterfeit to unity. It's the opposite. It's very clear. I believe, and we're going to see the study this out, that Satan wants people to be united as well. Just a false unity compared to Christ's true unity founded on the Word of God. For instance, you very rarely see a counterfeit $13 bill. You know why? Because there's no true $13 bill. And that's the same thing. You won't come up with division when Christ calls for unity. That's not a good counterfeit. You need to make it look like the thing, smell like the thing, taste like the thing. It has to somehow seem like the real thing, but in fact be principled on something totally different. Now, Satan wants Christians, and I'm going to say this and it's going to sound a little bit weird, but hear me out. Satan wants Christians to be united just as much as God does just as long as it's on a different foundation, a different basis. Not on the basis of accepting the truth of God and walking in the light, but in rejecting the word of God and walking in darkness. He has a counterfeit unity to Christ's intended true unity. Let me show you something. In the book of Acts, you see this played out. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up and gives that great 26-verse Pentecost speech, that sermon about Jesus and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven and his sitting at the right hand of God. And I want you to notice something. At the end of this sermon, he makes a very pointed appeal. And he says, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, and it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Notice they heard the word of God preached. And if you were to go through this 26 verse sermon that Peter does, it's fascinating. A full 13 verses, exactly half of it, he's just quoting Old Testament scriptures. Then the next 11 verses are comments on those texts and only two verses are appeal. So he preaches the word, he explains the word, and then he makes an appeal. Brethren, you've heard the word. The truth is you have crucified Jesus, the Messiah who is coming. You've killed him. And now he, that Jesus you killed, is both Lord and Christ. The word of God says so. And at the end of that message, the Bible records here, the people heard it, and it says in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. The word of God is like a sword, the Apostle Paul says, and it cuts down through all the pretension, all the different auspices, all the different things we put in front, and it cuts down to the very heart of the matter, and it says they were cut to the heart by the word of God by the truth they had just heard, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They've been confronted by the Bible truth that they have crucified the Messiah. What's left for us to do? And Peter, of course, says to them, verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And what was the result of this? So they've had a Bible study from the lips of Peter himself, and Peter preaches this cutting truth, and it literally says they were cut to the heart. They repent and they're baptized, and what is the result? Look closely now. Look closely. The result. Verse 42. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They didn't just happen to start getting along because they'd had a common experience. They continued steadfastly daily in the apostles' doctrine and, as a result, fellowship. We skip down to verse 44, and it says, Now all who believed, notice, were together. Their togetherness, their unity was built on a common belief that they had heard presented from the Word of God. They heard the Word of God, they were cut to the heart, they repented, believed, and therefore they were united together in Christian unity. Now all those who believed were together and all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as any had need. What a beautiful thing. And it goes on to say, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now we see the counter to that in Acts chapter 7. What we just read in Acts chapter 2 was the true unity Christ had prayed for just before his death that the disciples would preach the word and that those who would hear that word would be united together. And in Acts 2, you see the fulfillment of God's prayer. They were united on that foundation of Bible truth. But then we see Acts chapter 7, and I want you to notice some fascinating parallels. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, one of the seven chosen to care for the early church, is now called before the Sanhedrin to answer for his faith in Jesus Christ. And he recounts the history of Israel all the way back from Abraham and on forward through the time of the prophets, even to Jesus and his time, and basically gives the same punchline that Peter had in his sermon. You killed Christ. But notice what's different about his sermon. And it's not the sermon so much, but it's the reaction of the people to the sermon, to the message, to the word. Notice what he says, verse 51 of Acts chapter 7. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. So he outlines this history of Israel and their failure to be faithful to God's word, and he says, you are just the same as your fathers. And he goes on to say, verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Name me one prophet that they accepted and loved. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, speaking of Jesus, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. The same thing that Peter said. You have killed Christ. Your Messiah came to you, and instead of embracing him, you executed him. Now notice verse 54. 
See if it doesn't sound like Acts chapter 2. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. The word of God landed on their consciences the same way it landed on the people in Acts chapter 2. The 3,000 who were added to their number, who were baptized and believed, had that heart-cutting experience by hearing the truth from the word of God. And now the Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin heard the same thing. You killed Christ, your Messiah. And it says, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. But notice the next words, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They heard the same word, but they had a very different response to the word. Instead of accepting the word of God and being brought into true unity, they have now rejected the word of God, but watch what it manifests in. Again, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So he's presented the truth that they killed Jesus. They are cut to the heart, but their heart is hardened. And he gives them one last chance. He says, Just look, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And what's their response in verse 57? Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him, notice the language now, with one accord. They were brought into perfect unity, but it was a counterfeit unity. Not the unity that Christ desired to them, to hear the word of God and to repent and believe and come into the unity of the faith. But instead, they were cut to the heart, rejected the word of God, and came into a counterfeit unity of the rejection of God's truth. Notice that both camps are unified, but the difference is one is unified in acceptance of the word of God, and one is unified in their rejection of the word of God. Powerful thought. Both were cut to the heart, and both were brought into unity. Just one was the true unity Christ had prayed for and one was the counterfeit unity that Satan desires. You see, if I said, by the way, just a little interesting tidbit, what group of people in the Bible are joined together in one accord? Most of us would say, well, it was the people on the day of Pentecost, those who accepted the word of God. And that's true, but did you know more often than not, in the Old Testament and the New, those who are of one accord or brought together as one man in unity are not always the believers. In fact, more often than not, it's those who reject the word of God are united against the believers. Fascinating. Now, here are some interesting ironies. True unity requires division. Sounds counterintuitive, it sounds crazy, but true unity requires division. Again, think back to Amos chapter 3. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? If there's not agreement, and you keep walking toward the light and someone else wants to walk in darkness, chooses to reject the word of God while you accept the word of God, it requires division. True unity requires division. Often as pastors, trust me, I understand this, we are tempted not to preach the truth of God's word because it will be divisive. If you preach that message, people will stop coming, pastor. The youth will leave the church, we hear. Some people will hate you. Well, it might be true, but brothers and sisters, I'm telling you today, if you preach the un- unadulterated truth from the Word of God, you won't have to pay- face the possibility of people not liking you. It's a guarantee. There will be division. If you preach the Word of God with boldness, some will be united together in the faith and others will reject it and unite against you. It will happen. I promise you that. They will call you names. They'll say that you're extreme, that you're rigid, you're legalistic, you're overbearing, you're ungraceful. They'll come up with anything to say, your truth is not true. You can't accept that. They'll plug their ears and cry out of the top of their voice and go unite somewhere else. They'll go to other churches to hear softer messages. Trust me, they're not necessarily going to leave the church. They're going to leave your church. Apostle Paul talks about this, 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's telling his young protege, Timothy, what to expect in his ministry. And he says in verse 4, 
I charge you, therefore, before God and the, live, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his peering in his kingdom. So he's saying this. This is a charge that I give you in the name of God himself. Verse 2, preach the word, exclamation point. He didn't say preach philosophy, preach your opinion, preach what they want to hear. He said, you preach the word, and here's what's going to happen. He said, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For this reason, verse 3, for the time will come. Notice he didn't say the time might come, or it could happen, or just maybe. He said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Notice they're not going to abandon the faith. They're just going to have that off-brand. They're going to look for a teacher that will teach them something they already want to hear. By the way, what's the point of going to a teacher who teaches you stuff you already know or stuff that you think is right but isn't right? What is the true edification? They don't want edification. They want comfort in their error. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, speaking to Timothy, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Notice again that the people wouldn't leave the church. They would just leave his church or your church and go shopping. You hear about cheap, cheap church shopping. I'm just trying to find a church that fits me. I just want this to be molded to my contours instead of my contours be molded to this. You see, counterfeit unity doesn't discriminate. Satan's counterfeit unity claims that any division is bad. You hear, oh, let's be united, just be united, just be united. With no discernment, no discrimination, no judicious thinking whatsoever. Just anything can come on board. Christ's true unity requires division, but Satan's counterfeit anything you want. Come on in. One Christian author writes this, It's an honestly mistaken assumption that unity is always good and division is always bad. Christians who have bought into this concept unknowingly extrapolate this notion into a belief that God is for unity and Satan is for division. Friends, no, he's not. Those who have embraced this mistaken view of unity blindly support or promote any view or practices that are carried out in the name of unity. If someone puts up the banner of unity, oh, whatever they say has to go because we have to be united. You know, our unity, this is going to sound odd, but unity should not be based on unity. Unity should be the result of a commitment to the Word of God. Not just to the ideal of unity, but unity should be the result, the manifestation of a common faith of being of one mind and one spirit, one thought, based on the word of God. In Satan's counterfeit unity, we should stay united to each other, even if it means separating from Christ and from the word of God. But friends, we can't go there. Unity of the friends takes precedent over unity of the faith. Well, I know these people teach the truth, but if I follow this, then I'm not going to be popular with my family. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, if I go hear what they're saying over here, even though I believe it's true, it's not going to make me popular with my friends, or I might lose my job, or I might even lose my life. And it's going to divide me from safety, from popularity, from family bonds. It's going to t it divide me from employment. It's going to take me away from money. It's going to take me away from everything that I love in this life. But he says, if this is true, if you're truly cut to the heart, it's going to require division. But the unity that you will have will be pure, will be holy, it will be like Christ and his Father. And it will be something totally different than the counterfeit unity that Satan peddles over there. When you see things wrong, even in the church, you don't stand up or speak out because that would be divisive. And we don't want to be divisive. You might get tagged as an extremist. You might lose the respect of your peers. You might not get to sit at the cool table anymore. But friends, I don't know how else to say it, but I'd much rather have God's approval than even yours. The more I preach the testing truths of God's word, the more some people dislike me. The more some people are going to dislike those who are faithful to God's word. But my day isn't made by what you think of me. My day is made by what God thinks of me. 
and I want to be united with him, and anyone else who wants to be united with him, that's the fellowship of the faith that Christ wants us to enjoy. So this is my appeal. Don't be swayed by Satan's counterfeit unity. Don't compromise for the sake of your friends, your family, or your peers. You follow Jesus wherever he goes, as the remnant are described in Revelation chapter 14. These are they that follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And along the way, the Lord will bring into your life fellowship of genuine believers bound by the true unity is founded on the truth of the Word of God. If you make this your commitment, to follow Jesus wherever he goes, and whatever his word says, you go with it. It might divide you from other things, but it'll bring into unity of the faith with Christ and his body of believers on this earth. And that is irreplaceable. The approval of God should be our number one thing. Unity with him should be our number one objective. Every other unity is counterfeit, but the true unity that Christ has in store is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And it's my prayer to be a part of that, and I hope it's your prayer as well. So let's bow our heads for our word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you've given us your word. Thank you for giving us truth that we can understand. Though the ideas are so far above us and so wide and so deep that on our own we could not comprehend, you have given us instruction in your word. So Lord, let us be faithful to you as you've written it in your word. And Lord, from that fidelity, from that faithfulness, Lord, help us to understand what true fellowship is like as you bring us into the true unity that you desire all Christians to have. But Lord, keep us strong against the counterfeit unity that Satan sells. Help us not to be devoted to unity for unity's sake, but help us to have the unity that you want us to have based on your word alone. To that end, Lord, keep us faithful and make us useful for your cause, that we may reflect a little piece of heaven on earth, and we may be light in this dark place, and so that soon and very soon when you return, it is my prayer that not one will be missing. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.